Hello and welcome to the How to Travel Vegan podcast. I'm your host, Tom Simak, and today we're interviewing Jansen Andre. Hello, thank you for joining me for today's episode. As I'm recording this, Victoria is about to go on another lockdown with this whole COVID thing. So firstly, please be safe, stay indoors, stay isolated. And obviously, let's keep that 1.5 meters and just be appropriate, have some common sense. Thank you. But let's get into today's episode. So Jansen is an absolute awesome bloke, which is number one, and he... Definitely knows how to get things done. He's a vegan athlete, he's a model, an actor, and runs a popular vegan cafe in Melbourne called The Vegan Shack. In today's episode, we're going to dive into being a vegan athlete in terms of nutrition, training, and all the good things, and of course, mindset as well. We're going to talk about how COVID affected his business, The Vegan Shack, and defining health for us as individuals. In the episode, we talked about him doing a half Ironman and how he was going to attempt it two weeks um, after the episode was recorded. So the Monday of his attempt, I actually went and recorded the whole process. So if you want to go and look at the, I guess, process, a documentary style of the day, go over to his Instagram where you'll be able to find that. So it was an absolutely amazing day. When we are talking about it in the episode, I'm going to just butt in and give the actual results that he was striving for and what he got. But with all that being said, let's get into the episode and I hope you enjoy. All right. Good afternoon, Jansen. Thank you. Welcome to the How to Travel Vegan podcast. How are you doing, my brother? Good afternoon. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me here. Doing well, man. As you can see, I'm, I'm quite cozy uh, in the comfort of my own little kitchen here. It's freezing outside in Melbourne today. It is, it is, it's nine degrees or eight degrees, but like wind and rain and it adds on yeah. like just layers and it gets super hard. Have you trained this morning yet? So I have, um, I'm in a recovery week this week. So with my coach, uh, I work on like a three week cycle program with one week kind of recovery. Um, yeah. I'm training for an Ironman at the moment. Um, so yeah, the way that works with endurance is you need to bi- build, taper, and then drop down again and recover, so you can get better and better. I never knew all of this stuff before, so right. So the so uh, coach is kind of needed. Hey, definitely. I mean, so I started out doing the training by myself, and as as all guys do, or people who are keen, they get out there. I got out there and did three twenty five k runs in one week, and then I got to Friday and. So that 75 K is a clocked and couldn't move on the couch. <laughs> right. Yeah. Fair enough. That's, that's a pretty good yep. mileage, especially starting out training 75 Ks is a bloody toll on the body. Yeah. I wasn't ready for it. You got to ease into it. It's a slow burn. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, so much I want to get into just to start off the episode. Can you give us a quick one minute on why you're vegan? <laughs> Don't mind uh, dropping uh, plates and things. Yeah, sorry. Just my housemate just dropped coffee everywhere. Oh, oh, rest <laughs> um, in peace. Yeah, rest in peace, yeah. Why I'm vegan. I guess um, I kind of saw something when I was overseas uh, living in Europe. Um, I was actually in Africa at the time. I was already quite healthy or considered myself to be quite healthy beforehand. And then I saw a cow from me to maybe 10 yards or so away being slaughtered. Um, which kind of really hit home for me. I already knew what veganism was and kind of had a vague idea of what it was about. So I Googled straight away. Um, And of course, the first thing that comes up is food and food-related things. Um, Mm -hmm. So yeah, I I turned vegan and that was pretty much it. And then slowly educated myself with documentaries, information, um, yeah, you name it, and found out, why and how there are different products and things like face creams and clothes and stuff like that because you don't know all that right oh, until so you much, like look so many layers deep. always learning did you go cold so, yeah. turkey then straight like just vegan straight even though you're in africa in. you just just yeah. do it that was it and, and <laughs> since then you've traveled quite a bit have you found it to be much 
like difficult at all? Are you pretty chill with it? Um, okay. So it really depends on what kind of countries you're going to. Most places around the world do have like great sources of plant-based foods. Um, but when you're in third world countries and places like Africa, um, you know, Morocco and things like that, it can be a bit harder, but if you're, if the reason why you're doing it is strong enough, you'll always find a way, um, you know, to survive and, and eat some things, whether that's like fresh fruit and veg or cans of chickpeas, whatever it is. But yeah, some places are easier than others. That is for sure. Yeah. That's a hundred percent agree. And you know, there's, there's never going to, you're not always going to be eating luxury freaking meals. Sometimes it's going to be beans and sometimes it's going to be yeah. like uh, tomato and pizza. Like it's going to be so bland, but you know, again, it does come down yeah. to your reason. If your why is there, then that's pretty much the way to go. Yeah. And I do want to run that back straight into fitness. Cause that's what we started with. So cool, yeah. you're training for a half iron man at the moment, which is next week. What is a half iron man? What's the, it's like two so swim. The the half Ironman is so 1.9k swim straight into a 90k bike and then finishing off with half marathon, so 21.1k run. Um, so, yeah, I've been working up to that for the past six months since, yeah, probably end of December to now. Um, and as I said, I was training by myself for probably a month before I thought, right, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to need to get a coach who knows what he's talking about because I'm going to get injured. And it was clear that that's what was already happening. So he set everything out for me and brought me into this whole new world of endurance and Ironman training because um, it's more of a slow burn. Whereas my previous training was more like calisthenics, like high intensity yeah. interval training, a little bit of weights, CrossFit. So I'm used to like the explosive kind of stuff. Mm. And so I had to really wrap my head around endurance and like kind of take it easy rather than like go all in at the beginning because that's not the way it's done. <laughs> oh, no, for sure. And there's so many, you know, your body's just like, what are you doing, bro? <laughs> so not yeah. used to it. Um, now, yep. a half Ironman will, takes, what, six hours or something like that? Like, So I'm aiming for... Uh, five and a half hours, um, which I can probably do comfortably at the moment, I reckon. So bike three hours, swim 45, and then run hour and a half. I never done all of them in one go, so I'll have to see how my body handles that massive fatigue. Um, right. But those are my split times at the moment for the separate um, legs. And there's so much, I'm, I'm assuming, preparation that has to go into that because it's not just having the right gear and the right bike. You have to have spare tubes for the bike. You've got to have your gels and salt athletes take salts and you've got to take all these things. Have you found yeah. like plant-based alternatives for all of that in terms of? Yeah. Yeah, definitely have. So my coach is also, he runs like a plant-based kind of business as well. Is this plant-based Superman? Is that? Yeah. 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 Okay. So he, he's big on that, um, which is good. And he's also not just like full endurance. He's like he needs to incorporate a bit of strength as well. Because you see, you know, you look at marathon runners and Ironman and stuff and majority of them are either like fully shredded or like really skinny. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I'm thankful that he's big on that as well and he's really big on nutrition. Um, I've worked out what gels I will use come event day and when I need to use them during race times. But... For my training and stuff, I more stick to whole foods. So I, I would go on, say, like a three-and-a-half-hour bike ride or three-hour bike ride, but I'd pack dates with me as like a quick source mm, yep. of energy rather than gels just because it's a little bit cleaner. I tend to stick to more whole foods anyway. My body doesn't receive like processed stuff very well. So if I can just limit that to race day and know that they'll work for me then, then that's great. Yeah, that's really cool. And like obviously – it really helps having a vegan coach who kind of knows what you're talking about. And you, I know we're into nutrition for ages. So you've kind of learned what to do, what not to do and things like that. And then when you look at like Ironmans, you had people, obviously athletes in the world, like Patrick Boomian, Rich Roll, Scott Durek that are doing these amazing things. Did you ever think that as a vegan, you're, you've got a limit to your athletic capability or did you think you could build on that? Like we, did you have any limiting beliefs? I never for one second doubted my abilities to do anything once I turned vegan it was just I obviously felt straight away when I turned vegan that my fitness increased and man it was a long time ago now so I don't how long have you been fully vegan? remember but I 
probably five five years yeah, in a little nice. bit. Um, so, yeah, I don't remember what it was like before, but yeah, my my level of fitness and ability to gain muscle and strength and you know lift heavier weights or run longer and not get tired and endurance and stuff is just can't, doesn't compare to some of my friends who are not vegan. Yeah. Um, and I think now in 2020 and since that um, documentary, The Game Changers came mm, out, people are yeah. a little bit more open and kind of can see how it can work. Mm. So I never, yeah, back to your question, never once doubted my abilities. So, yeah, that's fair enough. And, and you know, it does help that there are people like Scott Jurek and, thing, and people like that yeah. out there who know that they can push capabilities. And you've even got like um, companies like Vega, which is a vegan supplement company sponsoring like these huge Ironman events. So there's clearly lots of people out there looking at veganism. Yeah. Think this is like athletic, like readiness. And obviously health is a huge part of your life. Like what would you define as what health, like what does a healthy person like look like to you? Um, a healthy person can, man, that can encompass a whole number of things which can range from exercise to diet to mental health. It's, it's a combination of all of that really. I mean, we live in such a yang life's life and everything's going so quickly, not so much now during COVID, but like we go from point A to B or point A to C and forget about point B in the middle. And when we just arrive at the end point, you know, I always used to say, and it's still true, people, you wake up and you go brew that coffee, you get in the car, sit in the traffic, you sit at the desk, you answer the phone, but not once did you think about how it was that you got to be there on that day. You like sit in, it's just like robot automation mode. That's the way we've been programmed. So someone who... I deem as being healthy is somebody who practices meditation, um, who takes time to be present in every single moment that they are, that incorporates, you know, exercise into their lifestyle, that eats the majority of like whole foods rather than processed types of foods, um, even if it's not veganism, like vegan stuff. But um, yeah, that incorporates mainly like whole foods because that's the way our body is designed to to run i guess it's the best type yeah. of fuel to give it um yeah i mean yeah that's a tough question <laughs> it is a tough question because because you're right it is it is very subjective like of course you've got your pillars like your sleep and, and and your nutrition and then your meditation now as like an athlete you have to be i'm going to just refer to you as an athlete whether or not you're professional or not i know you're sponsored so yep. i'm going to say you're professional <laughs> um, professional you're professional <laughs> where do you bring presence into like when you're cycling and you're three hours in or you're two hours in, like, where's your mind at? Like, what are you thinking about? Cause that, you know, people think a lot of the time, like they can't even run an hour and it's not the fitness side that's limiting. It's like, it's boring. It's, you know, where yeah. is your mind at like an hour, two hours, three hours into this, you know, bike ride or run or swim? My mind is honestly would just be focusing. So I always talk to myself when I get that far into something, because by then it's just like I'm just running on, I don't know what it is, um, but I'm just so deep in the zone of like left leg, right leg, left leg, right leg, breathing. Mm. I'm so comfortable with being into an event or exercise for that many hours now that it's just like you just get in this zone, you just switch off. I can have music running or a podcast running while I'm training. But, like, I feel like that it just becomes white noise to me. Whatever's playing in the background, I'm just so focused on, like, getting to the finish line or, like, just enjoying that moment. Um, yeah, I don't know, man. It's so fascinating it. how you're describing it. It's almost like you're having this meditation or practice of being present whilst you're literally, like, pushing your body's boundaries. And it's so fascinating how you're hitting this limitation or a physical peak but your mind is so calm, it'd be so more stressful calm. sitting in a car in traffic. So I find that so fascinating. Have you brought that mentality into meditation? Have you felt like that's changed much of what you're doing at home then when you're relaxing and you're not doing anything per se? Um, look, I'm, I've always been a big, big meditator. I haven't been meditating as, as much, I'll be honest, in the past six months as I used to. But I still 
yeah, I still do it before I go to sleep to kind of wind down from all of the white noise and lights and computer screens and stuff. I try and like, I now keep my phone out of my room downstairs on charge to keep that space as kind of my sacred healing resting space rather than having, um, mm, I like that. you know, that, that de- device in there that's, uh, what is it? The radiation is going through the room. So, and I already like kind of wake up without an alarm clock anyway. So it's not an issue. My body is kind of used to it. So I don't need that. But even if I did, I'd have like a, a watch for instance, that would, you know, wake me up. Um, but yeah, meditation is such an important part and it should be in everyone's lives. As I was saying, just to kind of slow down, and ground yourself, you know, because we're going so a million miles an hour every single day that we need to acknowledge and be grateful for, you know, our health and well-being and, you know, the people around us and the things that we have, a roof over our head even, you know, because a lot of people don't have the privilege or those, you know, things in their life. So meditation is, yeah, it's quite important. For sure. And, you know, you mentioned that you've stopped meditating, but I, I totally, totally disagree with that. I reckon you've just changed the way you are meditating. Because right. a lot of people would say, you know, LeBron, when he's playing ball, like he's meditating because he's in like a zone where, you know, the news doesn't matter. The whatever's going on in his life, his problems, his yeah. dramas doesn't matter because he's just doing that one thing. And, yeah. and a, I guess a way of meditating is just focus. That's one sector right. of meditation which is which is fascinating but you mentioned whole foods before what's like some meals that you absolutely live by crave by that maybe helps you with your training or helps you feel good what's something you love to cook yeah. up um dude <laughs> i know it's like getting cold now but i'm massive on on oats or just like even porridge in the morning whether it's buckwheat or quinoa for a high protein source mm. um yeah, a curries. I also I also see a um, Chinese doctor as well who helps me kind of with my internal kind of like liver and stuff like that. Um, and so I'm really big into fasting as well. Mm, what um, kind of fasting geez, do you do? Uh, I've ranges. So I've probably been fasting. I'd probably say since I was like 15. I did my first, not 15, 2000 and might be like seven, seven to eight years ago. My first ever fast was a juice fast. And then I've done mm. like a long water fast. I've done dry fasting. I do intermittent fasting. Um, I'd say I'd try an intermittent fast every single day, depending on what my um, training is. So if I'm going out for a long, so I do on Sundays now, I do all day fast uh, and then don't break it until Monday morning before holy crap so like the whole sunday that whole day pretty much religiously except for yesterday um <laughs> just had had a craving <laughs> that's all right um, just accept it just accept it yeah no so basically what I'm getting back to my chinese doctor she was saying the most important time to be actually eating for like for an athlete is between two and seven um that's when your body is like able to perform at its best so have your bigger meals during the day rather than at night. So I used to be reverse. I used to fast. Um, I still do. I don't yeah, listen like skip all breakfast the time and, to that. and start lunch. Or yeah, something. something like that. Yeah, unless I'm going on a big bike ride where I know that like I've done it before, fully fasted, and I get to like 60, 70 k's in, and I just lose my legs. Like I, I feel like I have no power. So now. I'm not that silly anymore and I will fuel up before. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah. And cause I don't do, yeah, go on. Well, I was going to say, it's really interesting that she said that because I actually listened to a podcast with Rich Roll and Dr. Gregor cool. last week. Cause Dr. Gregor released a new book, how not to diet after his book, how not to die. So this one's like, Did he? Oh, yeah, he, it's a new one. And then he's now he's working on how not to age. So it's really cool. And Essentially, he's, he did a thing on intermittent fasting because he, th- he went through a thousand studies and referenced them all in the book. So it was insanely densely packed. And he said when he was looking at intermittent fasting, it's super frustrating because there's like 600 studies just on intermittent fasting. And some of them are like, yes, this helps. Some of them are like, no, it's weight gain. And, and you know, that's 
I guess, everything. There's so much polarizing data out there. But he said the most significant thing was people, they did a study on the army with 200 men on each side, both doing intermittent fasting, one meal a day. And they had the same amount of calories, protein, fats, carbs for 200 men who ate in the morning, same amount for 200 men at, ate at night. So two different groups. And right. they found that everyone who ate at night actually gained weight. And the soldiers who ate in the morning were more uh, peaked physically and losing weight. So that it's like not when you eat. Sorry, it's not what you eat, but when you eat as well. So going back yeah, to right. what your Chinese medicine person was saying it's eating in the morning is actually really really important but also it's different for everyone but yeah it's so fascinating because i always used to think skip breakfast have lunch and dinner but recently in the last five years studies have said the other bloody side which is so confusing yeah. but yeah i guess that works <laughs> but also part of your iron man, half iron man training would be not only training your body for what you need to do and what you're going to put yourself through, but trying to find the best way to fuel it and, and things like that. And yeah. that's why it takes, you know, what you You said you were training for six months. Yeah, man. And in those six months, like there's nothing that's considered a small meal. Like I'm eating up to like when I'm on my big training days, four and a half thousand calories. Oh like God. it's just, so, it's just because no, I just burns so much, man. Yeah. Like I go on a three hour bike ride and burn 3000 calories plus my normal day-to-day -day stuff um, and then I'll do another workout and it's just like I need to keep eating so much food. <laughs> it gets tiring, which is why I incorporate fasting as well because I get sick of sick of eating sometimes. Sometimes I'm just like... <laughs> That's I, a funny just, way to look at that, it, yeah. <laughs> How do you feel when you finish like a two-kilometer swim or like a 100K bike ride? Like is it just like serotonin through the roof, like smile cheek to cheek or are you like on the floor crawling home? No, nah, man, I'm just, I'm still buzzing. I feel like I could just keep on going. Like it gives me such that, uh, that rush and, you know, maybe six or seven times out of 10, I'll jump straight into and do like a, a little hit session straight after something like that. Cause okay, I've just okay. got so much blood rushing through, through me. I'm just like, I gotta keep going, man. This is, I'm feeling it, feeling good. Mm. And, um, yeah. That's so fascinating. Just, yeah, no, I'm really, not, not tired. <laughs> Not tired. It's really interesting that because it totally changes what you think your body's capable of. It's like, you know, if you look back a few years ago, it's like, could you even run 20 Ks? And now, you know, you're going to do a five and a half hour freaking straight out the bat, something that a human is generally not even going to do in their lifetime. So it's, that's really, yeah. that's really cool. But I wanted to actually touch on, cause I didn't ask on it earlier. Why are you even doing this? Okay. So I just, I, I was friends, I was friends with someone for, for quite a while and I was kind of dating one of her friends um, and, you know, we were all kind of like a little group together and then um, she, we kind of broke it off and then I was still friends with like the friend, um, was still chatting away and she clicked sign up for Ironman Australia um, mm. on Facebook and I was like, you know, her and I were pretty level with like our fitness and stuff. And I was like, yeah, like I'll do it as well. Like, sounds good. Um, and not, not I guess knowing cousin, what an Iron Man was or? Nah, look, you know. to be honest, I, I knew, but like I didn't really know. And I still, even when I watch documentaries, I'm like far out. Like what I'm doing is actually just really intense. But yeah. <laughs> You don't know when you're, you're just in the zone and yeah. when people look at you from the outside, they're like, man, that's crazy. I'm like, no, it's not, not at all. Um, so yeah. And then I fully committed at that point to doing it to kind of, man, I, I don't know, to get the attention of that girl again or something. I don't know what it was anyway, way past that now. Um, and I'm always someone who try, likes to try everything. So when I saw it, I was like, yeah, man, live once, like, let's, let's give it a crack. You know, I've tried everything. I've tried vegan keto. I've tried one meal a day. I've tried fully raw, like in terms of diet. So this wasn't something that was going to be like, and I love challenges. I love to push my body and like you said, see what the body is actually, actually capable of. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the reason why I jumped into it. And then once I started doing endurance and stuff, I actually quite liked it. And like you said before, it became my source of meditation and I'm so thankful that during these times that I've had that to like go to, like to switch off, 
you know, when things become stressful or something like that, you know, financially, you know, I can go for a bike ride and completely just get in the zone and just refresh my whole body. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's the question. Yeah, I, I guess I forgot what the question was, but that's, it was just basically why asking for your why. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you basically followed a girl, but then you found yourself, which is really cool. That's it. Yeah. Um, so you're <laughs> such, doing a, boy. Oh, such, such a, a boy. Such a boy. Oh my gosh. <laughs> So you're doing a half uh, Ironman next week. And have you looked into yep. like, there's an Ironman coming to Melbourne in November. Did you know this? Yeah. So I was going to sign, I was going to sign up to that one, but that's also a half iron, which is a 70.3. Uh, um, iron. So my, so my original event was meant to be on June the 3rd uh, in New South Wales mm-hmm. and they postponed it to September. Um, so I'm still going to do that, but my full Iron Man is in December, which is in WA on December 6th. I uh, just made my final pay, um, installment payment yesterday. So that's it's like a thousand dollars to sign up to these things, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So like, uh, cause I was looking into, I was watching a few videos and stuff like that of like the Florida Iron Man's and like what it actually costs into these things. And I was, I was just outstanded, but it's, it's not. Yeah. Like it's, it's money is just, you know, money and it comes and goes, but it's so funny how you'd get so much fulfillment from it. But it's like, you got this bike, which is like super professional bike. You can't get this like hundred dollar Kmart thing that falls apart two yeah. kilometers in. <laughs> and then you've got, you've got, a, you've got like a cycle suit, you've got a run suit, you got a yep. swim Like that's crazy. Um, yeah. And then at this stage, it takes after you do your half Ironman training, is it another six months of training to do a full Ironman or how does that work? Uh, look, it's kind of just, you don't even have, to, I could do six months training and go into a full Ironman. You, anyone could do a full Ironman, but um, with no training. But, you know, if you want to do it to the best of your ability, mm. I kind of have the, the feeling and like I, if I do something, I want to do it right. I don't want to just, just do it. So I'm giving myself, well, I've given myself a full 12 months to fully get in the zone and, you know, let my body get to those stages where when I finish, I'm not going to be dead on the floor. Well, I possibly will be really screwed on the floor because a full Ironman is like 10 10 hours. Um, It can even be more, but I'm hoping by by the time it comes in December, I could do it in nine, 10 hours. Which is yeah, it's like ten thousand calories. Yeah. Like anything sub crazy. ten hours is just insane from what I've read. So that that'd be yeah. huge. And what I'm finding super fascinating is by the time this episode is actually out, you would have completed it. So I'll be able to put either in the intro or the outro how you actually did, which is super exciting. And then when this episode comes cool. out, you'll either be like shaking your head like oh, I didn't do it, or you'd be like, Yeah, motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hi guys, me again. I hope you're enjoying the episode. I wanted to pop in, just talk about his results for a second. So his total time was five hours and 39 minutes, which is absolutely amazing. He did a really, really good job and I'm super proud. So the swim took him 45 minutes for the 1,953 meters. The 90.5 kilometer bike ride took him three hours and six minutes. And the 21 kilometer run, he did in one hour, 41 minutes. So an absolute, absolute amazing effort. But let's get back into the episode, um, <laughs> which is awesome. And I'm super excited for you because like, you're an absolute beast of a machine. Like for all the ladies out there, like Jansen's actually oh. like the sexiest <laughs> human. Like, oh, come ever. on, shut up. <laughs> no. um, stalk me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I did, look, I have to stalk. It's a thing, you know, hosts have to do it. Um, I want to <laughs> completely change gears to Vegan Shack. Let's do it. So yep. cool. you've been running Vegan Shack for three years now. Is that right? No, nah, just over two years. So we okay. hit our second birthday the day after shutdown happened. So, yeah, we just right. missed it, but we're still there. Still trading at the moment. Takeaway only. Yeah. I've, are you guys... Is it June? When did restaurants actually open? Is it now good so, to sit there or how does that work? Yeah, so it was today, June 1st. Um, however, the rules and everything that's around it all just make it really difficult. And, mm. you know, like you have to have, you can have max 20 people, but they have to be spaced out, you know, 1.5 mm. metres per table. 
Um, and because we've got such a tight venue already, I could probably have six people in there, which would That's mean I would have to get yeah. somebody. It's not worth it. Also, they have to sign in, sign out. Um, you know, you have to take the temperature of the customers. What? And if there's, yeah, and if there's an outbreak in there, then you have to close for two weeks and everyone's oh. got to go into quarantine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've, fin we've suffered financially as, as most people have in hospitality mm. through this time. So we just can't afford um, to run the risk. So we're just going to keep it at takeaway for now and, um, yeah, just, just see how it goes, man. Hopefully, like next month, the restrictions ease a lot more because it is going in a in a good. Like, obviously, we can never it's, predict what's going to happen. Yeah. But yeah. um, I, I was going to touch on how COVID affected you guys, but it was basically just having to just shut was it's pretty hard because you like that's your baby. Yeah, that's 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 our baby. So it's I work together with my mum. Thank God I've yeah, got her. So um, yeah, she's such a lovely lady, and um, I couldn't do anything without her. So. Thanks to her for being by my side with, with this dream. And, um, you know, she's been there the whole way and I couldn't do it without her. Um, so, yeah, so what happened during COVID, basically, we shut for one week and then we were like, you know what, this is, I can't, we can't just sit around, you know, doing nothing. And we thought, you know, $6 is better than $0, uh, than zero dollars right like whatever the sale is it's better than sitting around doing nothing and i shit you not one day we made six dollars <laughs> no freaking way yeah <laughs> oh. hilarious um but looking back at that now then we we adapted like my mum and i when something's not working we change it straight away we don't wait until whether it's like a dish that's on the menu that's not selling and it's costing money because we're wasting food it's like right that's out it's not working as much as we like it People are not vibing it, so we'll change it straight away um, mm -hmm. and try and, you know, always working out costings and stuff like that to see, like, um, you know, what certain things cost and what's the return on that. So we jumped in straight away and started offering home delivery meals. Mm -hmm. So we've got, like, family-sized take-home meals because everybody was going to be home, right? Um, so, yeah, that took off. Did you take that opportunity then, to ride your bike to their houses at the home delivery at least? <laughs> <laughs> no, because the orders were too big. I, oh. I wouldn't be able to. Um, At least not yeah. in one piece. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so that kind of took off um, a little bit better than, than we expected, um, which was great. And then slowly people started coming out again, you know, to walk the streets and stuff. Because the first week, right, it was mm. like a ghost, ghost, ghost town. town. Everyone went into shock like we did. Nobody knew what to do. Nobody knew the rules. Like it was all and still is kind of very grey as to some of the mm. things, you know. So got my view on that and so does everyone. There's kind of a split with this whole thing, but we won't go into that now. Um, and then, yeah, so takeaway and stuff has kind of picked back up again, which is great. Like weekends are really busy and our take-home meal is like another avenue of income which we've added to our already existing business, which will continue continue on, which I think is great. Post-COVID, um, you're going to continue takeaway? Yeah, I think oh, so. Yes. Like, Vegan shack club is everywhere just like doing one of these. That's it. On the <laughs> Knocking on the door with your lasagna, baby. <laughs> <laughs> God. And you're um, not doing the deliveries, yeah. are you? No, so we we are doing. So they the can't deliveries expect a beautiful personally. Jansen to come up at the door and and be like, yeah. "No, I do. We do the deliveries. Oh, do. Yeah, we do them. We do them after hours. Um, so we do use um, Uber and Deliveroo yep. and um, all them DoorDash and all those things for during service hours. Um, but for when we deliver the home meals, we do that after hours. So it's either myself or my mum doing the deliveries just because to hire a third party would, mm. would be an extra, extra cost and sometimes True. got to hustle a bit more in this road. time hustle and bustle that's yeah it. um yep. as like this is gonna talk a bit more pre-covid but also post-covid now yep. do you guys get a lot of like non-vegans eating there as well yes do you find like there's extra pressure to have to impress them because it's like this might be their first ever vegan meal and they get like your pancakes, like you got to make sure they're like, you know, really schmick. So basically when, when I was designing the menu, I always had in the back of my mind 
that the food had to be palatable and, you know, visually sexy and tasty for everyone, not just vegans mm. that had it. So, yeah, when I was creating dishes, I wanted them to be, you know, childhood favourites or things that people kind of miss or like like those flavours when they weren't or when they weren't vegan and went vegan. So I wanted it to be food that was like, you know, it would just happen to be vegan. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah. It wasn't some like you know, salary on a plate. <laughs> right, right. No, that's and, not what you're about. No, and what, what we stand behind and, and, is, and strongly I believe in is food has to look great because um, you eat with your eyes, right? But also mm. it has to taste. It also has to match what it looks like. So visual is the first thing. Um, and then, yeah the taste has to be spot on as well. So yeah, we're absolutely. Trying, well, we we're start trying salivating when we start looking at really good food and that preps the That's taste right. buds to like, let's, it's go time. Let's do this. Let's go. Let's go. Let's the go. better yeah. it looks, the, the more taste buds come out to party. That's it. <laughs> That's right. Um, so for someone who's never been to vegan shack and they, yep. they rock up, what's like the dish that you, you say you order this and you will have a good time. It's got to be. Hard it's got to go. But. Yeah, hard question. When we were running dine-ins, I would definitely say it was our big breakfast. So that's yeah. got like that's like a party on the plate. It's got scrambled bacon, avocado, mushies, hash brown, house-made sauce. You know, it's got the whole lot. But for now, and the way we started was actually a sandwich shop. So takeaway sandwiches, and we've we used to have 10, 12 sandwiches on the menu. Now we've cut it down. Well, we cut it down. Once we moved to like dine in, because there was such a demand to so three top sandwiches. So we got the Reuben, which is like our version of corned beef, which is like corn tempeh, sauerkraut, pickles, mustard, cheese, and like a house. Jeez. Okay, wow. House, okay, size cool. noun sauce. It's, it's a mouthful. It's like a full on intense sandwich. And then we got our house chicken sandwich, which is like a schnitzel, which we make from tofu and chickpea. And then we've got our tuna sandwich as well, which we make the tuna from uh, chickpeas and almond pulp. So we keep the pulp that we so cool. make our fresh almond milk with. So it's kind of like a zero waste sandwich. How did you learn to um, make all these concoctions? Just out of passion, man. I guess like <laughs> when I when I first went with added passion, man. Yeah, that's it. When I first went plant based, um, you know, quite a while back, there was there wasn't much around, and I kind of had to create things for myself so i went i went raw vegan straight off the bat for eight months um how'd you like that yeah dude i loved it but then it came to it came to winter and my body just craved starches so i had potatoes man and i haven't looked back there you go that's it always (laughs) waxy or dirty always changes my life (laughs) (laughs) um so (laughs) Yeah, I guess the climate here where we live in Melbourne is probably not susceptible to having a broad diet, you know, somewhere mm. like California or somewhere up north, definitely a lot easier. For but, the barley you know, burgers, of- go raw, yeah. That's right, man. That's right. Um, yeah, so I would go with either the Reuben sandwich. It's probably our top seller next to the Snitty sandwich as well. The snitty. Um, yeah. That's awesome. And pancakes when you guys open up everyone got to get that love the pancakes um do you guys still have the toasty yeah yeah Yeah, we still so we got got like a magic mushies toasty a basil smash which is like your traditional italian um pesto cheese tomato just like that quick little one you can have with the coffee or just yeah yeah, you know for anyone who wants to see a toasty just head to instagram and i just posted it like last week up on the how to vegan one so have a Feast your eyes on that. Um, and then in terms of like running vegan shack, do you find that it's quite hard to be like sustainable or like minimizing your waste? Like what challenges do you guys have with that kind of stuff? Um, we like, like every food business is always food wastage. Um, but I try and minimize that by using um, like things like well, with the tuna that we make we keep the pulp from the fresh almond milk that we make i try and use things where i can to avoid extra costs but also to you know add in that 
um, element of sustainability as mm. well. Um, but yeah, it is hard as a food business, you know, because you're always forecasting what's going to walk in the door. And sometimes it doesn't always happen that Wednesday is as busy as the last Wednesday. So there's always, there's always going to be wastage, but I'll try to minimize that by like either before it's going bad, offer like a special on it or either consume it ourselves, knowing that we're not going to like get through that by the end of the day. Um, and in terms of like packaging and stuff, we always try and go with uh, very sustainable sources, like whether it's sugar cane or bi- biodegradable, you know, plant plant material. Is it easy to find manufacturers that offer like biodegradable things? Yeah, it's 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 out there at the moment, and um, yeah, it's I wouldn't say it's hard to find. You just have to look for it. But most big companies that offer those services and products will have a line of like whether it's sustainable or vegan or they'll have something now um Mm -hmm. and it's just you just have to marry up what the cost is and um some some of the times it's actually cheaper than really you know how is it cheaper i've always heard it's always like three cents more per this four cents more per that I guess it really depends on the monopoly that the company has who you're getting it from or I like that how you use the word monopoly. I appreciate it. Yeah. True. Don't pass I collect two hundred. Mm. Um <laughs> Yeah, so I guess it really depends who it is that you're buying from. We try and all of our suppliers we try and keep really small because at the end of the day, um you, you know, everyone's on this planet to survive and I'd rather give my money to like you know, small businesses rather than big corporations because I know it helps them out mm, um, and they're doing it for, they're doing it for the right reasons rather than, like I just said before, that addition of that vegan line or that sustainable line to their already um, unsustainable line, um, line of products. You know, while it's great, you're still supporting them financially to keep on creating those other products that people buy. So yeah. it comes down to ethics, who we choose as suppliers as well and we choose which is vegan like people who run businesses where possible and affordable you know it's like we use organic where possible and where affordable um yeah and there's this new cup that just came out it's it's called um i am not paper it's coffee cups right and it's made from it's made from plant pulp the whole thing is like fully biodegradable it's and it feels like nice, like even the lid, it's incredible. It's these two guys that just launched just after, just like the other day because of all this COVID stuff. Um, but yeah, I'm keen oh, that's to awesome. get it. Yeah. Are they launching it now? Cause keep cu- Have you noticed, like, because you guys offer coffee and I've had your coffee and it's the absolute bomb because you guys have a different milk. You have different milks than usual as well. So you use different com- a whole host of different companies. Have you, but yeah. like, on a side topic, have you guys noticed that a lot more people pre COVID are bringing in keep cups than usual? Yeah. Yeah. That's all. Awesome. Keep cups, keep cups would be definitely the norm pre COVID. Like oh, it, almost everyone had a keep cup, or if they didn't have the keep up, they'd apologize. Sorry, I forgot my keep cup. You know what I mean? So it's, it's become like, in their, in their brains and stuff that, that that's such a waste. And I feel like I know a lot of places stopped accepting even us accepting keep cups just Mm. throughout this time. And it's like, now there's just so much waste out there. Yeah. (laughs) I don't know. Do you think that it'll, it'll go back to being able to use keep cups? Do you think that'll like, obviously, you know, I'm Chris and I'm not saying that, but like, what's your opinion on it? Yeah. So we're, we're accepting keep cups again. And the notice that was received by a lot of um, businesses was you can accept them at your own discretion. Um, So so it's actually governments or like this governing body telling you as a business, you can't accept keep cups anymore. Yeah. Just for the whole health thing, you know? Oh, so there's okay. a lot of things that we've had to change in our place. Uh, now we've got like hand sanitizer as soon as mm. you walk in the door. Is that compulsory? Disposable. No, it wasn't, but it just showed um, the wider community that we actually cared about what was going on. Mm-hmm. No matter what our actual view on the whole thing is, whether or not, you know, um, it just showed that, you know, we were there and we were, we were taking extra precautions because like I said before, there's been a real 50-50 split with how people have taken this whole virus thing, mm-hmm. right? So we wanted to cover all boards and, you know, look like we were doing the right thing, which we are. And yeah. 
a lot of people like also because I know a lot. It's a it's a huge portion, especially that big breakfast that you mentioned earlier. Some people bring like their takeaway containers as well. Yes. Yeah. It's awesome. That's really yeah. cool because I know a lot of people I've spoken to like, oh, they'd be embarrassed to take it. I'm like, no, it's not about that. Like a lot of businesses actually appreciate it because one, you're not contributing to the cost that they have to pay for that packaging. But two, it's like, that's awesome. Like everyone's going to commend you for that. That's extra effort you've taken that you didn't have to take because that's not the norm. So that's really cool. That's right. And we would give discounts, you know, when people would bring their own sort of takeaway containers just to, you know, show them like, thank you so much. Like, you know, you're saving the planet, you're saving us costs and we're going to give you a discount for doing that, you know? Yeah, that's awesome. I reckon all businesses should offer some. Should. Because, you know, it's, it's, it, cause it doesn't cost you much to get a cup of cup. It could be 10 cents, 20 cents for a container. But yeah. it's, it's, it's aligning your business with their why and values and that creates community, which I think is awesome. But um, on wrapping up here, because we're just around the hour mark, I believe, is there wow. anything that I know? If I, I time feel, flies, eh? Looking at the time, I was like, "Wait a second, is that legit?" Because it, it's it's hard when you in the, when it flows. You know, time just is so chill. Um, so, firstly, um, good luck on your half Ironman next week, and I'm really excited to update when I do the intro and outro with what you've done. Um, even if you Maybe. haven't done your time, we will still send you love because that is a <laughs> it's a huge effort. Let's be honest, like a hundred what seventy. 100 kilometers altogether, 120. That's huge, um, yeah. huge effort. Is there anything you'd like to leave? Um, I guess it's going to be a majority vegan community listening to this, or what would you like to leave the world with any wisdom or anything that you'd like to, that you're super passionate about that you want to share? I guess I would. There's one thing I'd just like to say, and that like everybody sh- should always be reassured of is that no matter what your decision is in life, it's right for you at the time. Um, if, if it feels right, don't try and do something because somebody else is telling you to do it. It needs, you need to come to the decision on your own. Don't be forcefully, don't be forced to make that decision because somebody else is doing it. You know, whether it's, you you need to be able to come to that in your own time. Yeah. That's awesome. That's really inspirational. Thanks, man. Thanks for starting. And yeah. So adding to that, like basically everybody's on this planet to be happy, right? That's the main goal for everyone. End goal is happiness. So if someone's doing something and they think it's right, don't try and discredit them because you're going to be ruining their happiness. And like, Mm. why it's just not needed. Do you know what I mean? That's why I never judge somebody by their decisions or how they look because, you know, that's them in their moment. They think it's right. Cool. Let them run with that. Like you do your own thing. What you're doing is not necessarily what will work for them. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So Yeah, for sure. Yeah, end goal is happiness. So be kind to every kind. <laughs> be kind to every kind. Um, and where can we find you? We've got your Instagram, which is, it, it's now like turned into a complicated name, isn't it? It's like, yeah, it has. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I just messed around with that. <laughs> I don't know. But oh, no, it's not. That's just the name. That's just the name. What, That's just where, the can name. We, where can we find you? And Vegan Shack Find me well. there. Find me at the Vegan Shack. Find me on Instagram, or um, also, um, little side note: I have been writing it for probably about two years now, and just since I opened Vegan Shack, haven't um, actioned it or anything. But I'm getting back into actioning it now. Is a book. Oh, dude, that's um, huge! Yeah. Well, when yeah, when the book so- comes out, I'll go back in and put it in the show notes so people can go straight to your book. So, how, do you know what the ETA is on that? Uh, it's still it's still in the editing kind of phase at the moment. Mm-hmm. With um, I got to have another few meetings and stuff, so we'll see how that goes. Because the book industry has obviously hit hard as well during this time, yeah. so everything's kind of like been pushed back. Um, but yeah, exciting things coming. So I've always wanted to educate people and show passion and um, tell my story as well. So that will be another place you'll be able to find more. Absolutely. Well, everywhere you can find Jansen, including Vegan Shack, I will leave in the show notes. And when he blesses us with that book of his, I will also put that um, in the show notes. But other than that, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast, brother. Thank you so much for having me. Good luck on your own, man. Thank you so much for listening all the way through. 
as we speak, Jansen has begun training for his full Ironman. So if you want to follow his journey, please head over to his Instagram. That's where he does a lot of his updates. Thank you once again, Jansen, for coming on the show and talking about, well, all things really. And of course, if you're ever in Melbourne, check out The Vegan Shack. Absolutely amazing, amazing food. Order everything on the menu, obviously. But with any links to Jansen's journey, I will leave in the show notes. The next episode will come out in a fortnight with the amazing Jimmy Halfcup. The focus is going to be on regeneration, climate change, and environmental activism. Jimmy runs halfgut.org, and that basically restores and buys back rainforest, which is a really, really cool cause. I can't wait to share the episode with everyone. And of course, follow us on our journey, How to Travel Vegan, on Instagram and TikTok and YouTube. Of course, if you are watching there, like, comment, subscribe, leave a review if you found this I guess, insightful or helpful in any way. And until next time, much love. Peace.